Hello, everyone. Welcome to APM Conference 2021. Um, in this session, we'll be talking about building iOS device form from scratch with David Helkowski. And without further delay, I'll hand it over to you, David. All right. Thank you for the introduction. As you uh, just said, I will be talking about uh, building an iOS device farm. And uh, before I get into it, I just wanted to give some thanks to some of the people that made this possible, which is uh, T-Mobile, who originally let me make this an open source project uh, in some of the earlier incantations of this, uh, Lambda Test, who is actually currently a sponsor of this project and is using it in their products, and they will be releasing it soon, or it's part of it right now, I'm not exactly sure. And also, I want to thank Daniel Paulus for being very cooperative with sharing information and also thankful for his software that he's created that is actually being used by the software that I have made. And the first thing I would like to do actually is to you know, show the demo of actually what has been created so you have an idea as I'm presenting the different portions of it of you know, what exactly has been done. So without further ado, I will show the demo here. So hold on one moment. So what you see here is actually uh, this on the upper right is a live feed of actually four phones that are connected to the system. And on the left here is like what you would see when you log into the system to be able to control some phones. So I'm just going to quickly go through here and you know select a couple phones. And you can select a phone, you see a video feed of the phone, you can interact with it swiping back and forth. You can click elements, you know, as if you're actually interacting with the real phone in, in person. And you can see it's uh, very quick. The video of the live phone is matching up almost exactly with what I'm doing on the phone. So just to demonstrate that you can see each different phone and interact with it in the same way, even though these are all different types of phones. And also I wanted to demonstrate uh, that you can type into the phone using a keyboard. So you can see you can type smoothly and you know effectively do manual tests remotely on the phone without having to actually have it in person. So that's about it for the demo. So I'm gonna move on. So uh, uh, first, a uh, little bit about my background. I actually don't have any extensive background in working with Apple devices or Apple software. Uh, my only background in it was actually some number of years ago, I was actually uh, Apple phone tech support for Apple products, which included like Apple PCs and phones at that time, which is mainly PCs. So, you know, <laughs> it is kind of interesting that I ended up working with Apple products, but I do have an extensive background of developing full systems, enterprise systems. I kind of specialize in enterprise content management for what I've done. I worked with a, a great number of different languages over the years, which has enabled made it a lot easier to be able to develop something from scratch that does end up using a lot of these things and you know looking at reference code. And some of the project background, as I mentioned, originally this was created, well, originally some software was created for STF. STF is an open source uh, device farm for mainly Android devices. And when I was at T-Mobile, they actually asked me, you know, could you make something that does, could you alter STF and make it also support iOS devices? So that actually ended up creating an open source project called STF iOS support, which did that. And that took around a, a year to do on and off in various incantations. And a lot of this research that I'm going to be presenting about actually was a part of that. And what I found was that at T-Mobile, I was somewhat restricted by, they didn't want to build anything from scratch. They wanted to modify the existing STF which is mainly in Node.js. And that ended up being uh, somewhat problematic because it's, it's somewhat legacy at this point. And so in the end, you know, I, I found that at T-Mobile, 
it was able to work somewhat, but not quite as much as I wanted. So actually, eventually, you know, I was working through a consulting company at T-Mobile. And eventually I was able, when I left there, I decided to actually rewrite everything from scratch, fresh, without using SDF to be able to solve a lot of the architectural problems and security issues. So that is what actually, you know, kind of triggered this whole thing is I said, hey, I actually want to continue working with this and actually make it even better. And, you know, that, so the demo you saw is the result of that work. And I've actually sold the, the currently created product back to T-Mobile, which is interesting after leaving there. And there are two main, main clients. The one of them uh, wishes to not be named. And the other one, as I said, is uh, Lambda Test. And to start out with uh, discussing like the different types of things that go into making a full device farm, uh, you kind of think about the requirements of like, what do you need for a device? What is a de device farm? And generally what you think about is, you know, the video display you saw, you want to be able to interact with it, like touch screen, taps, swipes, so on and so forth, entering text. You want to be able to install your apps and you want to be able to then run tests on those apps or, you know, conversely run tests against your mobile websites. So, you know, for apps, that would be XC test, web drive version, Appium scripts for mobile apps would mainly be Selenium, but you can also use Appium as well to control your mobile apps. And then you also want to be able to monitor, you know, those tests to see what are the memory usage of those tests, what are the CPU usage, so on and so forth. And then there's a whole slew of other things that you might want, like rotating the device back and forth, um, making slower network so you can see like what happens with your apps or your sites when someone has a bad network connection, what the, you know, battery usage is of like how much drain your apps are causing on the device. You, you may want to be able to like record video of like certain test runs or failures so that people can see like when an automated test fails, what's going on. And I'm not going to go through all these because there's a lot of them. And I want to move on with uh, discussing some of the creation of these features. So in those idea of the requirements, the, the first question is what already exists and what can be built on in order to create those features? And to interact with Apple devices, that's, that's the main thing is like, how do you actually automate Apple devices at the low level? And the main thing that's been created is a thing called a libi mobile device, which is an open source implementation of uh, Apple software that interacts from the, the PC to the phones. And that has a lot of different features. It, it, it's quite capable, but some things it does not have. And it's also quite complex to understand how it works and how to integrate it into your projects. Um, it is actually a re-implementation of what's called the mobile device framework, which is a private Apple framework that was made by Apple. And they, it, you can reverse engineer it and lower like just dump the, the binaries of it and see what different calls it has. And that's generally what all these different things are doing is they're, they're re-implementing the calls that mobile device framework already has. There's also um, WebDrive agent, which is a, it's an XC test that runs on the phone, but it's long running and provides an API that you can make calls into it. So instead of like making an XC test with manual actions, it basically just waits for you to send it commands and then executes those XC test commands. Uh, and then there's another thing called iOS deploy. iOS deploy is an open source uh, software that actually makes calls to the private mobile device framework to mainly install apps on phone. Uh, some new things that were created in the process of doing all this is Go-iOS, which is by Daniel Paulus. He created it and I believe has uh, discussed some of that. And iOS IF, which is my own implementation of various calls on top of the mobile device framework, which only runs on Mac OS. So in the first uh, consideration is like, how do you actually detect devices that are plugged in, into a machine in order to activate them and show them on a farm? Uh, you could think about like using Launch Agent. It's an Apple um, feature to like activate software. It's sort of like System D, but for Mac OS. So it activates different services. And there is some limited features to activate uh, some software when you plug in a USB device, but it doesn't work as you'd expect. It's not a venture for like when you plug in a device and then remove it. It's basically when a device is present, it repeatedly tries to do something. So it doesn't really work for the purposes of this. 
Another option would be like polling. So you could just, you know, run any software that gets a list of connected Apple devices and then use that to repeatedly poll it and then like watch when one appears or disappears. That's obviously not a very good solution. Um, the next option that I tried was uh, using a USB device driver. And this is actually works decently well is you just take like the basic stock Mac OS uh, USB device driver code and you make it not do anything except for send a notice to some software. So basically like it just pretends to be a driver for the device so that you can get the notice of knowing when the device is plugged or unplugged. And this was actually being used in some of the earlier incantations of this. Then there's the, you know, the Apple uh, mobile device framework, which is what I was using for a while. And it was, was my own implementation, iOS IF, that uses that to get notices from the official, you know, private uh, framework by Apple. Then LibI mobile device also has the ability to do this. You can like look at their implementations of listening devices and you can sort of make an adventure of a thing. I haven't actually done this because it, it's inconvenient to do. Um, as also go to ISO iOS by Daniel Pauls, he added a feature in my request that matches my iOS IF implementation, which is basically just, you know, you run the command and it just says when the device has been connected or disconnected. The next thing to consider is like, how do you actually show uh, display of the video on a phone, on a computer, you know, through the web? And one method would be screenshots. Unfortunately, the way screenshots work through the Apple tooling, actually, I'll get into that in the next slide. And this is just the overview. So there's uh, screenshots, you know, you can use like an HDMI dongle. So like Apple has their own dongle you can plug in that has an HDMI app. And then you could use like a, a HDMI capture device after that. And then like daisy chain, these kinds of things in order to get video. Uh, there's AV Foundation, which is Apple's uh, framework for, you know, streaming AV stuff. And it has the ability to get at that video of a plugged in de device. And FFmpeg has an implementation that uses AV Foundation that you can use. And uh, once again, uh, Daniel Paul wrote some software that also interacts with this AV Foundation method. There's a replay kit, which is a, it's a called an extension on iOS. And you can use replay kit to then stream video through like RTMP or JPEGs or something else. And then there's also web driver agents. So XE tests that run on the phone, there are private XE test calls that let you get, take a, 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 an image from the full screen. So web driver agent, which was originally created by Facebook, but is now in by Appium and they're the maintainers of it, um, has a, an ability to get a streaming MP, MJPEG through HTTP of, and basically what it does is it, it repeatedly takes uh, screenshots, but it, it does it in a way different from the official Apple ways. So it's uh, slightly better in some ways. And I'll discuss a, a few of these in, in a little bit more detail, which is like the screenshots, the problem with those is that they're, they're PNG and they're full resolution. So these can be multiple megabytes in size just for a single image. And the speed at which you can actually get them is only around two frames per second at the maximum, which is, is not very good for you know, interactivity or the way, the way it looks, the way it feels. And unfortunately, Apple does not provide Anyway, you know, through their, their, their basically API through a USB connected device to get a lower resolution or to get JPEG instead of the PNGs. And as I said, like there's the HDMI dongle method and just picture here are some devices like this one in the top middle is actually a full computer that actually does not work in the same way as an official Apple dongle. It uses a different streaming method, but it's just interesting to see that like there's different ways to do it. Um, the dongles on the top right is actually just like a, a splutter so that you could power it as well as use another dongle behind that. The one on the top left has like network as well as HDMI, as well as USB. And then if you did this, the problem with this is if you get a stream of video like it's encoded in H.264 from a capture device, you would then need to re-encode it into JPEGs. So like in the bottom left is like a Jetson Nano, which is capable of uh, simultaneously decoding like four H.264 streams and then re-encoding them to JPEGs that could be used. Or you could use something that's like a, a Pi array, which is basically what you see in the bottom right. Uh, the other method is would be using um, like AV Foundation. And 
basically, uh, so if you open QuickTime on a Mac OS computer, you can actually get a stream of the uh, USB connected iPhone and see it by uh, selecting the device from there. It actually shows up. So that's why here it uh, shows as AV Foundation slash QuickTime. And that's also why the software that uh, Daniel Paulus made is called uh, QuickTime Video Hack, because he basically re-implemented what QuickTime is doing in order to activate the video. And AV Foundation can also do that by itself without QuickTime. So it's sort of disingenuous because like it's actually AV Foundation and QuickTime just happens to use that. So Apple actually sort of documented how this works by in one of their uh, conventions, they said, oh, you send this basically like act secret activation command that's not documented anywhere else except for the conference. And then it like activates the video. And myself, as well as Daniel have, have both reverse engineer this and see like what does that command do behind the scenes and it sends like a special control packet. Um, the problems with this is, is Apple just sort of threw it together. They actually use it for their presentations of devices. Like when you see them presenting at conferences about a device, they're using this feature. And you, you can tell that because when you use this feature, the, the stream from the phone is fake and they fake out the top bar. They show full battery charge no matter what the actual charges of the device because you know, they don't wanna show a conference with, you know, oh, it doesn't have full battery charge. So if you use this method, you, you can't tell the, you know, in the bar, the actual charge of the device. It also shows the specific time because Apple always has this weird thing where they like, any presented device has a specific time of release or some nonsense like, so it does some strange things, but the way this actually works is it, the phone encodes in an optimized way to H.264, and then just sends that raw H.264. They're called H.264 NALUs. The NALUs are, each NALU is like a chunk of video data. So you can then process those that H.264 stream and turn it into JPEGs or something else. And that's one of the issues with this is that it's not scalable because if you have like 10 devices connected to one machine that's providing those devices to a farm, then you would have to decode 10 simultaneous H.264 streams and turn them into JPEGs or potentially you could just stream the entire video stream out to the user, but then they would need to be able to decode those H64 streams in their browser, which some users may or may not be able to do. Um, the, the other method is a replay kit. So Apple provides this extension, you know, as I said, that um, lets you get at the, it lets you write an extension to the phone that can run across the whole system. And then it basically receives the video data and you can do whatever you want with it. Um, the issues with this is that their examples are very bare bones and don't really do very much. And the open source examples of this, that there, there are open source examples, but a lot of them don't work correctly. Or if you try to use them, they're, they're very flaky or they're very hard to integrate. And the issue with making your own version of this is that, uh, there's a very strict 40 megabyte memory usage for, in this extension. So if you ever go over that 40 megabyte amount, it just arbitrarily kills your extension and it's very hard to debug that. So you have to be very careful with how much memory you use when you're doing this. And also like you would expect that you could use like system logging to diagnose, you know, if you if just add the log statements in the middle of your code to see like what's going on. Nope, that doesn't work. It, sometimes it works, but most of the time it does not. It just throws your logs in the trash because it basically treats the extension as like privileged code in the system and it doesn't really do very much. And you can sometimes connect Xcode to it to like breakpoint in the middle. But the problem is it's constantly receiving frames from the system. And if you add a breakpoint in like are pausing and trying to see what's going on, it's the, it, it starts freaking out and it basically crashes. <laughs> so it's very hard to debug this kind of stuff. Uh, the examples of this that exist uh, that I initially tried were using RTMP video streaming which actually works terribly. I, I don't, I mean, in, in some instances, maybe RTMP can be great, but I, I can tell you that quickly streaming things with a 40 megabyte usage in an optimal way and, and setting up the whole procedural stuff to display in the browser is very complex. In the end, I just chucked it and I said, no, this is not worth it. it it's too hard to do, the latency was bad. It's much, much, much faster, much, the latency is much lower to just encode two JPEGs. So this is actually what I'm doing in the current implementation is I receive the video data and I quickly encode it using hardware compression on the phones and then I send those JPEGs out. So the machine, like macOS machine or Linux machine now that the phone is connected to does not have to handle any encoding or decoding. 
and that lets it be far more scalable. So you can connect many devices without having to worry about, you know, your host machine getting bogged down. Uh, the next thing to consider is like, uh, you know, after you have videos working, is how do you actually emulate uh, touches on the devices? So, you know, that's taps, long taps, just the list of things you can see here. And so there's different options here and I'll discuss some of these a little bit. So for tap, you can use XC test options, uh, actions do allow you to do different things. And the web drive version is, sits on top of that layer as I said, is an XC test, long running XC test. So you can use that and it provides an option called tap. You can use tap to, to <laughs> execute the tap, but unfortunately it's very, very slow. The performance is terrible. You, you don't want to do this because there's like a second lag from when you actually execute this call to it actually occurring. Then there's also a thing called touch perform, which lets you perform a sequence of things like click here, move your finger to here, then move it to somewhere else. And that works much better and it doesn't have that second delay, but it still does have like about a quarter second to half a second delay because of the way it works. So ultimately under the hood, it calls an XC test uh, private function called synthesize event. And that ends up being the best way to do this. And it's very performant. And so I'm actually using a modified version of WebDrive agent right now that strips out other things the WebDrive agent does that slow it down and add more lag. And it's just directly called synthesize event to make the taps. Another thing that I researched in the process of this was, is like, can you run VNC on a phone? Is there anything that does that? Any app, any method? You know, I scoured open source looking for things to do it. There is something, but it only runs on jailbroken devices. So there's a software called VNC that can be run on jailbroken devices, which works great. <laughs> and then it shows video and it lets you, you know, control it very efficiently. But since it's only for jailbreaking devices, most companies don't want to use that. They don't want to touch it. And it also doesn't run on the latest devices or the latest iOS versions. Um, so as I mentioned that in the process of this, it's taken several years actually to find out what are the most performant ways to do this? How do you minimize the latency so that when you're interacting with it, it seems as smooth as possible? And that ends up being somewhat complicated just because there's, there's so many small details that can affect the performance. And, you know, so besides just directly calling the event, even just things like um, the, the number of, actually I'll get into that in the later slide, like the way the, the requests are being executed. So like I'm actually using a nano message partly to accelerate some of this. Because if you use HTTP requests, even HTTP requests one off add extra overhead compared to just sending a message across an nano message. So, you know, when, when you, you start dealing with the latency of like making it seem as if it, you have the device in person, it gets very finicky with those smaller details. The next thing would be like a text entry. So how do you do that? Uh, WebDrive agent also provides a thing. It's like a, you can call the keys command to enter some text. But unfortunately, if, you, if you're typing on a keyboard and you, ex, you send those requests to WebDrive agent over HTTP, it will scramble and mix together your text that you've typed and you end up with text that's in the wrong order. So you can sort of work around this by doing it slowly and like watching for the responses, but it's very finicky, it doesn't work. I was doing this initially and I eventually abandoned it because it's just a bad solution. So, and also you can't execute like certain um, control keys. Like you can use, you can send like an enter key, but like backspace or delete don't work properly or like home or end stuff like that is not possible. So there's another call that was recently added. Um, I guess within like six months ago, they added this, which is another private call with an XC test, which is IOH ID, which is basically like USB devices, like keyboards are a human interface device as well as your mouse is. And there's a call that can actually initiate keys. Um, this call, interestingly enough, doesn't allow you to make, it doesn't, so normally when you enter a capital key, you hold shift and then you hit the key. And that's actually two calls to the HID interface. And this exposed API call doesn't appear to have the ability to combine that to like do, basically do the shift command. So anything that can be done through this is now being done by this and it's much faster than the keys command but capital letters actually have to go through the, the other slower commands. So I'm actually using a mixture of these two now. 
uh, one thing that you can encounter in this, and I noticed, is it's, it's easy to get bit by this. So if you're using WebDriver version, make sure to send the HTTP um, headers to actually say that you want to reuse the connection because WebDriver version is not using HTTP2, which would automatically do that. It's using HTTP1. And if you don't do that and you execute many, many commands, so like if you type like 100 keys, just typing normally on the device, you will end up using up all your uh, file descriptors on your system <laughs> very quickly and then you'll, you'll have problems. So I encountered this just a heads up for anyone using web drivers and making calls to it. Make sure to do that. Another option would be to like use a Bluetooth keyboard. Some people, some companies are doing this. They emulate a Bluetooth device from like, you know, a dongle connected to a machine. So it pretends to be a Bluetooth keyboard and then they send in keys that way. That does work great. That's one option. It's slightly more complex. I'm, I'm not doing this because it, it's harder to do. Um, at some point I may switch to this. And also the problem with this is it's not scalable. In a data center, if you have many, many devices, you're gonna have issues. Uh, you could also use like a, a USB keyboard. So you could like use an R Raspberry Pi or something as some embedded device to pretend to be a USB keyboard and then like plug it in through a dongle. But then you have to use a dongle. So there's advantages to this because you can like get to the task switcher. So like on an iPhone to be able to view like the running tasks and then cancel out one, cancel one out. Uh, there's a keystroke on a USB keyboard that you can actually activate that. There's no other easy way to get to it. Like on the newer devices, you can swipe up them from the bottom at like an angle to get to it. But on older devices, there's no direct way to do it through a remotely controlled device. And the, a lot of the device farms, even the commercial paid ones have this problem where they're like, you have to use the accessibility icon to get to the task switcher. It's painful. So this is one advantage of that. And this would actually be beneficial. And I'll be supporting that in the future. The next thing you want to be able to do is like install apps. The biomodal device provides ways to do this. The previously mentioned iOS deploy, iOS, I have the thing I wrote also can install apps by using the mobile device framework. Uh, the implementation by Daniel Pauls also provides the ability to do this. One thing to keep in mind is just uh, that any app that you install needs to be signed for that device and needs to use provisioning profiles. So ultimately what I will be doing is adding support to you know, automatically do the re-signing of, of apps so that your build system can create an unsigned app and then send it over to the device farm and then automatically be re-signed with the credentials and deployed to whatever devices need it. The other thing you know, I mentioned that you need to be able to do is run, run tests. Uh, this was initially for, you know, the first year of this project, there was no way to do this. Uh, you, I mean, you could do it through Xcode, but it was very slow and it was not scalable. So, because you have one, um, Xcode is very heavyweight on a machine and you can only run one, you can only run one simultaneous XE test on a phone at once when you're using Xcode. And, and there's also various other issues, like you can't do it on Linux because Xcode doesn't run on Linux. So, and you need this to be able to run WebDriver agent because WebDriver agent, as I said, is an XE test. So what is now being done? Um, so like now I'm actually using GoDash iOS in order to do this. And it's doing it by, it's a reverse engineered implementation of what web what um, Xcode does under the hood in order to start tests. And also simultaneously when that was released, uh, TI device, which is by Alibaba, they also released an implementation that does this. So before um, Daniel Paulus or Alibaba have released their implementations, there was no open source code to do this at all. Like if you wanted to do this, you had to reverse engineer yourself and no one wanted to share it. And I feel, I feel like the reason why is because everyone was worried that like Apple would attack them for reverse engineering their stuff, but it's necessary in order to make a device farm. If you don't reverse engineer things, you will not be able to do what is necessary. And like everything, like web driver is reverse engineered, GoDash is reverse engineered, the stuff I've written is reverse engineered, and Apple just is mum on the word on this. They don't say anything about it. I've tried to like ask them. I've talked to like a few people, I won't name names at Apple, and they're just basically like, yeah, we know people are doing this, we don't care. So it's a rather strange situation. The other thing you wanted to be able to do is like monitor apps and tests for, like I said, CPU and memory usage. Uh, the Apple thing that does this is instruments. It's part of Xcode. Um, you can, so the, the only thing that actually does this, it's open source right now, is the thing that I wrote, I, iOS, IOF. So I looked at what 
commands are available in the underlying private framework. And I figured out how this works and I made a call that does this, but it only works on Apple because iOS I have, it only runs on Apple so far. It can be ported though to go-iOS and that's gonna be in the near future. I'm working with Daniel Pauls on that. So I mentioned uh, dproxy here. It's part of uh, a go-iOS that lets you actually dump anything that Xcode does. So you basically start the proxy and then you run some commands on your device and then you can then see like what Xcode actually did. And then you could potentially like extend go to iOS yourself and then run those commands. So it's, it, it's, it's very complex. And Maxi, I mentioned like the, they use a special serialized RPC methodology that was very painful to write. Um, I wish they documented this. All of this stuff is not documented by Apple, but uh, you know, it's necessary if you want to be able to get the sort of statistics that people want for their tests. And that's pretty much the, the wrap up of all the different things that have gone into creating it so far. Uh, the lessons that to be learned from this is to be persistent. And I, I say this because a lot of people along the way have told me it can't be done. There's no way to do that. <laughs> it doesn't exist. Apple will never allow that. You would have to reverse engineer that and then you'll get in trouble. Like I've been told by companies like pe people don't want to hire me directly on this because they're like, we don't want to be responsible if Apple gets angry at it that you know, they're going to come after our big company for creating this stuff. It, it's, it's pure silliness. <laughs> and also to, to try everything. The number of things that I've tried in the process of creating the device farm is, is absurd. Like, like I'd say 75% of the work I've abandoned. <laughs> it is not used because it was just Things that I tried to try and see, like, does this work? Is there any way to make this? Is this better than the other options? Just because you have to go through every single thing to find out the best way to do it. Like, you can't give up. You have to, like, keep trying, 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 trying. And if you do, you can eventually make it work. And also what I found interesting is that GitHub search has become very useful for me. Because if you find, like, specific keywords in code that you know may relate to what you're doing, you can then search for all implementations. And I've, I've, I've spent hundreds of hours scouring all available implementations that interact with phones because it's so badly documented. And the only way is to like find any code that does it and then take that and then learn from it and then create other implementations of it. So as I mentioned, reverse engineering is necessary for everything Apple. Apple really needs to get on top of like actually embracing the community and going back to their hacker roots. They really don't care about the community of developers. It's kind of disgusting. And that's one of the reasons I've stuck with this project because I want to work with the community. I want to cooperate with everybody. I'm tired of like all the, the commercial implementations of device farms for iOS saying, we want to charge you ridiculous amounts of money. Everything I made, everything you see here is completely open source. It's completely free. I'm not trying to rip off anybody. I want to make this stuff work because we need this sort of tooling in order to better automate Apple devices. So that's it. And... I wanted to give the rest of the time over to Q and A. Yeah, and sure. you can see these slides at uh, control4.com is the domain for this. There's very little information there, but I did put a version of the slides there. I'm going to need to update them also. It's a slightly older version of the slides. I'm going to add more links to different references. So if you want to learn more about stuff, but yeah. All right. Thank you so much, David. So we have a few questions over here. The first one is. Um, can we access remote devices from SDF if SDF is deployed on the cloud? Yeah, sure. So SDF, so the implementation that I did for SDF was the first round of this. So there, it's been a year since I've really touched that implementation. Um, and SDF itself has essentially been deprecated. The uh, community surrounding SDF has forked the project to a thing called Device Farmer which I'm actually one of the founding members of. And I eventually will be contributing back the changes that I made, like in the process of creating control for it's an entirely separate implementation it has nothing to do with SDF anymore. It's completely rewritten. So eventually I will provide the ability to then provide devices from control for into SDF so that people can like merge them that way. But I'm not really heavily interested in doing that because it's, it, I spent a good year working with SDF and I don't like the code base. It's very messy. So that will happen at some point, but I, I really need like funding of like someone to say, hey, we'll pay you money to make this happen because I know how to do it, but I'm just not going to spend any of my effort at this point unless someone pays me for it. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, so another question, this is actually a series of question. Um, how stable is, uh, how stable is current solution for iOS device farm? Can it be used by private companies? And how much time do you think it'll take until it's also support, it also supports Android? Is it possible to integrate with APM? It has a lock mechanism, mechanism which when a device is in use to prevent others to use it. Thanks. There's a couple of different questions there. Uh, I'll address the last one first, which is, uh, does it have a reservation mechanism so that one person doesn't interfere with another using the device? And yes, it does. So I, I didn't demo that, but uh, when you select a device to view it, it actually shows that it's in use by another person. And then you can then kick that person off if you choose to do so. And there's some options for that. Um, as far as it being stable or not right now, yes, it is stable. Um, this is currently being deployed by some top companies. Uh, my main client, which I said wishes to be unnamed, they are actually looking to deploy it uh, to more broadly within like the next two weeks. And as well, uh, T-Mobile is going to be using the solution. You know, they, they purchased the software for me and they're using it now as well. They're going to be using it very shortly. Uh, I guess they need to contact me and work it out, but yeah. Um, Lambda Test is also integrating this currently. So they are using this behind the scenes to provide their offering for iOS devices for remotely control them. So like um, of those solutions, probably one of the best ones would be Lambda Test because they're gonna, they have their own employees that will be adding additional features and, and you know, monitoring stability and making sure it works as well. So this is like a one person project. Like I am the company, I'm the person who created all of this. So I, I work with Daniel Paulus somewhat, but I, I'm only loosely sponsoring his project. Like he, he's, not, I wouldn't call him a coworker because I'm, I, I'm only slightly sponsoring this project. It's not very much money. So um, you, despite that, this project has been multiple years. It's been several years creating this. So it, it is very, everything has been done to make it as stable as possible. Um, and it does also run on both Mac OS and Linux at this time. Um, I've noticed, I'm currently working through some issues on the Linux version. The Mac OS version is the most stable at this point. Uh, I've seen some issues with like uh, GoLang 1.17, but if you use GoLang 1.16, you deploy on a Mac OS, it's very easy to set up. Uh, if you're reasonably technical, you can probably get this set up within an hour and have it running on your device. It's, it's, it's meant to be as straightforward as possible and not confusing. Um, I think I missed one of the questions in there. Um, but... What about the, is it possible to in, integrate it with APM? Oh, oh yeah, so, yes, the integration with APM. So uh, I sort of mentioned this in the middle of the talk, which is that with through Xcode, you can't run multiple XC tests at once. You can through go-iOS and through TI device. And this is important because like I'm using a modified version of WebDriver agent, which is the underlying support for APM. Like APM needs that in order to be able to work. So you can simultaneously run support for connecting to the device farm and for, running web driver agent and then running Appium on top of that. And I haven't added the, the support for it. I will be doing in the very near future of like making it automatically start up both um, web driver agent and Appium for you. And what I'm going to be doing is actually making it. So the way the security model works for the system, unlike, uh, you know, the modifications for STF is that all the commands you, you access go to the server portion and then the provider, which is then in turn connected to the device. You don't interact with that provider directly. So like essentially the, the endpoint for Appium will be the server portion and then it will automatically forward all of those web driver calls over to the device so that then that web driver is actually authenticated. And Appium doesn't actually work this way right now. It doesn't have any authentication. So like it expects that it's just using an open web driver version and that's gonna be slightly different. So I'm gonna to have to tweak that slightly for Appium. But right now you can just run your own web driver version on the devices that are connected to the farm and that will work. But I'm gonna integrate that a little bit better in the near future. Right, okay. So we have one last question. Um, is it possible to build smart TV farm? Any suggestion on how to start? Yes, so uh, Lambda Test has actually um, asked me to add uh, support for the Apple TV device. I don't, I don't have one of these devices right now. Uh, it should be doable. I don't yet know all the details of this because it's, mainly I don't know if it supports like upload broadcast extension like the iPhones does, which is the current way I'm showing video live from the device. 
If it does, then great, then that'll work perfectly. If not, I'll have to use some of the other video mechanisms that I mentioned. Uh, it does support running WebDriver Engine. WebDriver Engine already has support for it. So it, it essentially should work. And, you know, like I said, I, I'm working with Lambda Test and they are paying me to add support for it, or they, they will be. <laughs> and so the, probably you'll see results for this working maybe within a couple months from now. Uh, there's still a lot of other things to do, as I mentioned, like the, the whole slew of things that requirements, uh, mainly only the basic bare bones the MVP stuff is working so far, but it's it's stable now. And that's what I've been working through for the, the past four months is making everything as stable as possible. So now that stability has been reached, I will be adding a lot of the additional features. And like I said, is also as well making the TV device work. So I think that brings us to the end of the session. I'm David. Thank you so much, David, for sharing your experience today. And thank, thank you everyone for joining my talk as well.